morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's session of Breakfast at Young Health live webinar series. My name is Lydia, and I'm a medical lecturer with the Rheumatology Unit at University of Malaya Medical Center, and your moderator for the first session on rheumatological complications of COVID-19. More than two years into this pandemic, there is now better understanding of the cytokine storm, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and multi-organ dysfunction that occur as a result of immune dysregulation triggered off by the COVID-19 infection. This altered or maladapted immune response is also the basis for many rheumatological disorders, such as lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, seronegative spondyloarthritis, and vasculitis. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker today, Professor Dr. Sargunen Sokalingan, who is a consultant rheumatologist and the head of the rheumatology unit. He has a special interest on cellular and molecular immunology, and he will be speaking on COVID-19 complications that affect the musculoskeletal and immune systems. Please note that we will have a Q&A session right after this first talk, so please type your questions in the Q&A box. Without further ado, Professor Saganin, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Lydia. Thanks for the introduction and good morning to everyone. Thank you for giving the little team of rheumatology uh, their little space to speak to you. Ideally, we would have loved to take the session next month because next month is World Lupus. Um, the World Lupus Day falls around next month, but uh, that's okay, no problem. It turns out to be, to be World Health Day. So we got some World Day coming up, and uh, I think really it's, it's one of the, I think, pressing concerns and urgency because the world has gone into, at least Malaysia has gone into an endemic phase. And I think uh, this means a whole lot of new problems that we can anticipate. Fortunately, it's not about the disease of COVID-19 being the deadly entity that it was. But I think, uh, I think many of you are going to be very curious about things like long COVID. And uh, I have to add a disclaimer that someone is asking me, are you going to talk about vaccination? Okay, so we're not going to talk about vaccination today because there's really so much more to talk about in the understanding of COVID-19 pathophysiology and how autoimmune disorders now seem to be taking the brunt of the complications of COVID-19. So um, I think we have these numbers are a bit of an underestimate, but the total number of cases to date, uh, we are reaching 500 million for a little bit of context. Uh, 500 million was the number of people who contracted the Spanish flu back in 1918. And the deaths in that was coming up to 50 million. Uh, some say it goes up to 100 million. So the planet has done really well in those terms, in terms of containing this disease. In Malaysia, unfortunately, we have had about 35,000 deaths. And uh, yes, the, days, uh, the, the numbers are in fact still there, but of course much, much less in keeping with the endemic phase that we've gone in. Look, just to keep a simple point to any lecture, I give you the list straight up. And you could see that it's an exhaustive list. Um, there really is quite a number of spectrum that we're looking at. We are looking at neurology, hematology, you're looking at endocrinology, uh, you're looking at rheumatology, and also dermatology. Quite a number of fields are really uh, involved in this, and you could even see NMDA receptor encephalitis, cold agglutinin, neuromyelitis optica, which is really interesting because you will see certain links uh, coming up there. But really, it, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. I think all of us listening to this and here today will know that not just any disease, but autoimmune disorders requires what we call a layered cheese approach, which means all the, if you take the Swiss cheese or with all the holes in it, you have to put four cheese up stacking one another and all the holes have to fall into one place. And that is where we see that genetics, and today we talk about gut microbiome, environmental factors are all known to cause autoimmune disease. They are rather, they have these triggers that are required to form autoimmune disorders. They don't just come in like being struck by lightning. There are already factors interplay. 
But what we do know, uh, infections are definitely one of the biggest triggers. And without infections, we're not going to see any form of autoimmune disorder coming in. There, there, there seems to be a very important reasons such as bystander activation and molecular mimicry. Those of us who are interested in immunology will be very familiar with these terms. And a little bit about the pathophysiology of COVID-19. I know many have, have gone through this time and again, uh, might be a bit repetitive, but it really has the basics. And we look at the numbers here in terms of receptor recognition, that means the virus needs a receptor. It has to dock with the receptor and it has to activate with that whole docking system. It has to enter the cells through endocytosis and this is aided by the receptor or receptors. And it is, while you go and you have to remember the cytoplasm is not exactly a friendly environment to any virus. You have lysosomes um, that are ready to break these things apart, but they actually have an endosome that is actually uh, designed to protect the virus ultimately until the viral RNA, RNA is released to go on and do its damage. And a repetitive slide, I know, but we need to look a little bit into the structure where you have, what, what I've uh, forgotten to mention is if you could see my cursor and my cursor is looking at this little structure here. And that is, surprise, surprise, the angiotensin converting enzyme to protein. And we remember our days, isn't it, from medicine where we remember um, ACE as being one of those important enzymes that's involved in the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism that helps to regulate our, our blood pressure. If there's, there's very little blood or less blood going into the kidneys, a drop in the blood volume, a drop in the blood pressure. So we know that just our apparatus now secretes renin, which then from the, of the liver changes angiotensin to angiotensin one and two. And what happens is you have your angiotensin converting enzyme, which we thought as enzymes, but well, guess what? It's a membrane protein. And along with this, what we call TMPRSS2, which is the transmembrane uh, serine protease two, a combination of this that now allows the COVID-19 to get into the cell. And these are just a little bit a reminder that uh, the nucleus, yes, is an important component, but what we are looking at here is that we, we um, okay, sorry about this, let me make cursor, just move it. So what, what we're looking at is once the virus has gotten in and it's uh, fused to the membrane, the viral RNA is released, there is a process of translation and replication and back to translation again, where the, 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 the cell now is triggered to produce the very same capsules, the very same spike proteins and the very same RNA through the combination of the endoplasmic reticulum. So you remember the endoplasmic reticulum is a paranuclear structure that now is a manufacturer of the virus transmitted to the Golgi apparatus, which then sends it into the cytosol and back out again. Now, this is the process that we're looking at. But what happens here? It is so interesting to note that our ACE2 enzyme or transmembrane protein is located in these structures here, which are all red in color. Obviously, the lung that we studied back in our medical school days is, is a home of ACE. And then it turns out these are also available in the heart. It makes sense because we know that now angiotensin has an aldosterone together work in, in increasing your blood pressure. And there are inflammatory enzymes or inflammatory substances that actually creates a vasculitic type of process. So where there are blood vessels in abundance, you will see ACE in the heart in the kidneys, in the ileum, and the bladder as well. So this is how the virus has hacked into the human body quite in a way that we have never seen before. Now, this is a busy slide, but I'd like to take you through to the next phase where we've talked about ACE and so what and what happens here. Well, in this brilliant study done in China around the time of uh, the COVID pandemic when it first started. So what we're looking at is the question came about when you divide patients who've gone into the ICU, <coughs> severe COVID, 
and those who got COVID, a large number of them didn't end up in the ICU, and we took healthy controls. So in this paper, they tried to identify, because when you talk about a virus, the first thing that comes to your mind is the activation of the innate immune system. Now, if you remember your immunology, the innate immune system is made up of neutrophils, macrophages, uh, dendritic cells, complement system, and the NK cells. And the question came about, what are the cells that are involved and the cytokines that are involved? So when we look at the process, we knew that the cytokine, cytokine storm was coming up, but what were the triggers for this? And if we compared the patients who were in the ICU and the nine, so these are about 12 patients, about 21 patients, and some healthy controls, you could see that uh, granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, interleukin-6, interferon gamma, and the differentiation of the CD4 cells. Now, we'll talk a little bit about the differentiation. All have higher values in our severe cases as opposed to the non-severe cases and definitely in the healthy controls. So very quickly, they were able to identify the cell lines and the cytokines that are involved. And from that, we could create a composite picture. And again, another busy slide, but bear with me. So if you remember our CD4 plus T cells, which are essentially our helper T cells, have to be differentiated to form a certain forms of cell lines. Some of us know, uh, we know them as TH1, TH2, there's TH17, I believe there's a TH22, and so on. But what we do know is that by activating cells such as inflammatory macrophages, which come from monocytes, and uh, it's not shown here, but dendritic cells, which are really the, one of the most important cells that have been uh, implicated in much of the cytokine response that we're looking in particular interferon. And we could see that now these cytokines trigger a response which can be toxic to the cells. And these are toxic to our type 2 alveolar cells. And when there's toxicity, there's cell destruction. When there's cell destruction, there's debris. When there's debris, there's a further triggering a vicious cycle that now creates the perfect storm that we call it that is filled with cytokines. And here we look at interleukin-6 as one of the primary drivers. Now, I talked to you a little bit about the the, the, the differentiations that we see. So um, if you look at TH1, uh, Treg, unfortunately, it's not very much called upon. TH1 and TH2, um, ignore this. This is uh, from actually basically a cancer study. But what we are looking at is the intracellular pathogens, which are in fact your virus, and it drives autoimmunity. And that's exactly what we're looking at and the link that we find here. So now it's a little easy to understand. There's also, we are more familiar with the TH17 pathway that is seen in ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, and rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. But the interplay between TH1 and TH2 is important in lupus. So there have also been studies of trying to look at the cellular line. So TH2 involves your mast cells, your histamine-mediated cells. And we do know that this is one of the things that we see in asthma. But you have to understand when the lung is involved in such a toxic environment, you do have the bronchoria, you do have the bronchospasm, you do have quite a number of fluid and secretion. So we believe that the TH2 pathway is also involved. Now, that is about the lung. And the other important component, if this slide is busy, just remember that endothelial dysfunction is one of the hallmarks of COVID-19. Now, why? ACE2 is also located in the blood vessel walls. In the endothelial cells, we have ACE2. So the exact same process is happening. Maybe the mediators are a little bit different. We have the reactive oxygen species. Because of the reactive oxygen species, the beta-2 microglobulin, which holds on to one Willebrand factor, now it's oxidized, one Willebrand factor is released into the blood, and now you have the coagulation cascade. The damage to the endothelium itself leads to platelet aggregation. And now you know the basis for thrombo thrombotic phenomenon and thromboembolism. So COVID-19 targets ACE2. It triggers the cytokine response mostly to TH1 pathway, macrophage and dendritic cell activation, endothelial damage. And here are the cytokines they are mediated, in particular interleukin-6, re uh, releasing the acute phase reactants such as serpent protein complement hyperactivation. Now, if I told you this is a talk on lupus, or this is a talk on Stills disease. 
this exactly works in the very same way. The only thing is, we do, in those diseases that I just talked about do not involve the ACE2. Now, this is how the virus hacked into the system. And so we have the cytokine storm. We've heard so much about it. Um, we knew about the cytokine storm because we see it in uh, the nephrologists and the transplant um, uh, physicians uh, know about graft versus host disease. We encounter it all the time in autoimmune diseases. Um, I believe uh, our ID team uh, sees the cytokine storm in severe viral in, uh, infections. Uh, Kawasaki's disease is one of those multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And in the treatment of acute lymphocytic leukemia, you have uh, CAR therapy, which can trigger. Now, what I'd like to show you here is the cytokines that has now been triggered from the response that we are looking earlier, causing the systemic inflammation and a dramatic representation here that it is in fact a feedback loop that we need to break. And this involves a number of tissues, not just uh, the lungs, it actually involves quite a number of tissues in all the body. But what I'm trying to say here is interleukin-6 is one of the biggest mediators of the cytokine storm that has been very much proven. And that is the reason why we are giving interleukin-6 inhibitors in uh, patients with COVID that we predict are going to develop severe disease. So this is in fact the very basis for rheumatological disease. Now, what are the rheumatological diseases that have been reported during COVID-19 and post-COVID-19? So it's not hard to imagine that inflammatory arthritis and arthralgia has been described in very great deal. Many patients complain of joint pains. Simple, synovium. In the synovium, whatever cells I talked about is present in the synovium. Sometimes it's called the powerhouse of, of the human body because it contains blood supply, it contains neutrophils, lymphocytes, plasma cells, it contains dendritic cells, it contains macrophages, it contains fibroblasts. And connective tissue disorders, as you will see, the triggering of the plasma cell activity, creating these antibodies that we in rheumatology are rather familiar with. It is not rocket science to understand that vasculitis now is a big problem from the pathogenesis that we have seen. And because the involvement of multiple organs, it's no surprise that we see something like Kawasaki in both um, uh, adults and children, because we do know that it is seen as children. Now, the good news is how we manage them is exactly the same with a few caveats. Right. So in, inflammatory arthritis is not um, new to us. Uh, I think many of us know about chikungunya, and chikungunya has both a chronic and an acute phase. So the acute phase is, is really very painful. Uh, chikungunya means bent over, stooped over, it's, it's Swahili, and the joint pains are so bad that the patients have to keep the joints, including their, 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 their hip joints and their knee joints, in a sort of a flexed condition, which is why they're stooped over. Any number of diseases such as hepatitis C, <clears throat> power virus, hepatitis B, and rubella have been associated. But bear in mind that these diseases are mostly arthralgia. There's a difference. They have joint pains, not so much of joint inflammation. And the pattern that we are seeing mostly in 15% of patients who complain of joint pains, uh, 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 so who have got COVID-19, is mostly arthralgia rather than a full-blown synovitis and myalgia as well. The cases that we have reported are rheumatoid arthritis and seronectic spondyloarthritis. Now, this is just to show you that in chikungunya, now let's, let's take a look. Why is it a little different in chikungunya? The reason it's different is because chikungunya doesn't target respiratory cells. Uh, it doesn't target uh, endothelial cells per se. Um, it does target endothelial cells, but not to the extent that you see, but what it focuses on epithelial cells and fibrolars and macrophages itself. And when you trigger like this, the response is somewhat um, uh, uh, sort of attenuated because it goes straight to the cytokines, which now have a target. So what happens in cytokine storm? There's no real target in cytokine storms. But when cytokines have a target, in this case, it's a synovitis, you don't see much of what we call as a cytokine storm that creates all the toxins, that creates all the hypotension and the, uh, what you call the, the venous thromboembolism, the microthrombi phenomenon. So chikungunya is more like a irritating a very painful disease that progresses to form a chronic arthritis. This is a case in Singapore shortly after the pandemic where they picked up a reactive arthritis in an Indian gentleman, a gentleman from India, 
um, who's working in Singapore, who also had swelling of his gland spinis. So the alarm bells went off, but it turns out this chlamydia gonorrhea syphilis were all negative, uh, or the antigen test was negative and so on. So, um, and this uh, with the COVID-19 PCR was positive. And so they treated it as reactive arthritis with simple um, um, aspiration of the knee joint fluid and then injection of steroids and giving the person um, COX-2 inhibitors, the patient got better. The whole list of connective tissue disorders um, is, is, is here. Now, what, what I'm trying to show you is that, um, has SLE been reported? Yes. Uh, antiphospholipid syndrome? Yes. Positive antiphospholipid antibodies, similar to antiphospholipid, it's just that the patients don't develop thromboembolism, uh, which is uh, target organs and so on, where there's, there's a stroke or a DVT or a pulmonary embolism, they just have positive antibodies. Now, the triad of genetic predisposition, hormonal and viral infection is very well described in connective tissue disorders. Uh, thromboembolic event, lymphopenia, myalgia, and myositis. And these are the antibodies that you're looking at, the anti-SSA, anti-SSB, and uh, anti-MDA5 antibodies, which uh, is specific for myositis. Now, I put the heading as connective tissue disorders. Reality is, these are all described in COVID-19. So a busy slide again, but what I would like to tell you is that if you have very good uh, case reports and a combination and looking at what we do see in COVID-19 is that there is a positivity in anti-nuclear antibody. Uh, there is lymphopenia, there's elevated uh, proton bin time and APTT that we see in antiphospholipid syndrome. Um, and we also see that there is also a picture of uh, mac, uh, macrophage activating syndrome. So in all these cases, the patients has require, uh, have, have uh, recovered. Unfortunately, in case one, the patient um, didn't survive. The patient actually died of uh, multisystem disease. Now, I think uh, it's, it's, well, the answer is about that. This is an example of a patient with COVID-19 with pericardial effusion. As you can see, the complex is already small. There's hardly any R wave progression. So this has been very well described as well. And uh, myositis uh, is an um, important component of COVID-19. And this is also ACE mediated. It can be a presenting feature of COVID-19 in a middle-aged woman who complain of chest pain, bilateral lower limb weakness, and raised creatinine kinase. Checking the creatinine kinase is absolutely paramount importance in COVID-19 because this is one of the clues that myositis is a process and it could be immune mediated. The patient responded well to prednisolone, ibuprofen, and colchicine. So ray ck is really important and the pathology is probably direct virus-mediated injury. Uh, it could be tissue hypoxia and microthromboembolism. And it is important to also check the anti-nuclear antibody. So in patients who have had covid we may have to monitor their anti-nuclear antibodies. They may turn positive. And when that happens, and if there are features of myositis, we need to actually send for the panel of myositis and the extra extractable nuclear antigen. But the good news is they all respond well with corticosteroids and immune modifiers. And what we are seeing here is um, the involvement of the kidneys. Now, you will see later that we are looking at a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. If you remember your immunology and hypersensitivity reactions, type 3 is um, immune complex mediated tissue damage that we are familiar with in lupus. And we see glomerulonephritis, acute tubular necrosis, interstitial inflammation, podocytopathy with membranous, uh, or sorry, rather proteinuria and hematuria. And that could be a rhabdomyolysis component. And therefore, renal disease has very well been described in patients, in particular, of the anti nuclear antibody is positive. End result is is COVID 19 autoimmune phenomenon? The frightening thing is yes there is an up to 50% prevalence of autoimmune disease-related antibodies in one critical COVID-19 patient. So COVID-19, when it gets worse, when it gets severe, think of autoimmune disease. And these are the antibodies that have been very well described. Um, I am a little short of time, but uh, there's so much that we can talk about perhaps in the future of the SSA antibodies. Now, vasculitis, for the reason that we talked about, has been very well described. And we know that from post-mortem studies. And it is through these post-mortem studies that we found immune complexes in many tissues of the body and most of them in the blood vessels. And these are the different types of skin lesions that we've seen. We've seen chill blades, you see urticaria, you see pustular lesions. Uh, this has been described in a brilliant study done in Spain during the height of the pandemic. They had over 375 over cases. The pneumatologists got together and say, hey, listen, this is time for us to look at what are the dermatological manifestations. And as you can see, they have Stephen Johnson-like, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? 
erythema multiforme and maculopapular eruptions and so on. So even vesicles have all been seen and gangrene as well. So the lesions are mostly small and medium vessel vesiculitis. And that would mean that we are looking at the possibility that you may have anchor-like antibodies like proteinase 3 and also myeloperoxidase has been described. But again, this is very interesting because rituximab has given, been given for these cases while they were having their COVID and the prognosis was excellent. It is the seronegative disease that can be dangerous because we don't really pick it up. And there's one case of fatal gut vasculitis ended up in perforation. IgA vasculitis has also been destroyed. Okay, I'm actually running short of time. I think many would be wondering what this long COVID is about. Sorry, we will talk about it the next time. But the data seems to indicate that we need to talk about large vessel vasculitis. And yes, so I, to be fair, we actually are gathering data to look at what long COVID really is because there seems to be a whole uh, spectrum of uh, symptoms and signs that are being seen in these patients. Now, I talked a little bit about Kawasaki disease. So this is the pediatric component. And uh, in certain places, they found a 30-fold increase in, uh, in, in Italy. Um, it tends to see most of these cases in, in the eastern provinces, or rather the eastern nations of Japan and China. But um, what happened was the trigger was seen as a medium and small vessel inflammation in cases which had high concentrations of COVID-19. And this is basically macrophage activity syndrome with uh, cardiovascular gastrointestinal involvement. And uh, the... Um, the patients respond very, very well with a high doses of aspirin and immunoglobulins. So taking you back to the whole spectrum, I hope in this short time you understand how it is that autoimmune disorders are now becoming something that we need to look out for. Whether this is short term or long term, it's only time can tell. Um, if you do see cases that you suspect has an autoimmune component, in particular autoimmune uh, rheumatological component, by all means, please send as if you're looking for lupus, as if you're looking for rheumatoid arthritis, as if you're looking for ankle vasculitis, and do uh, call us and send us a referral. We'll be happy to have a look at the case uh, once you refer to us. So it is truly COVID-19 is associated with development of rheumatological disorders. It is an autoimmune phenomenon and how this virus is different from, I'm sure the ID team and the virologists among us here will be able to tell us better this, but it looks like the targeting of this protein that is a, trans, uh, that is a membrane protein is perhaps a new trend for emerging viral diseases. And the arthritis is actually mostly arthralgia. We need to be wary about connective tissue disorders such as SLE and myositis. And vasculitis is seen in both the initial infection and as a complication. And long COVID is a part of this. So understanding the pathways has led to life-saving therapeutics. Now, that's another topic, how you ended up using many of the drugs that we use in rheumatology, such as dexamethasone, intravenous methaprenicillone, um, baricitinib, uh, uh, tocilizumab. These are drugs that we use. And well, it turns out that we were using this along with the, the, the antiviral drugs. And yes, of course, there's also talk of uh, vaccination and its success and perhaps the diseases that are appearing post-vaccination, uh, which we are looking into. That's my last slide. Thank you all very much. And I'm open for questions, if we have time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sabinen. Please type your questions in the Q&A box. Do we have any questions? Professor Sagarin, um, if I may start off with a question while we wait for a few more minutes. Um, we are now better informed that the COVID infection can trigger off a rather long list of diseases, including autoimmune disease and the cytokine storm. What about the COVID vaccines triggering off arthritis? Uh, most are short-lived, but some can run a more prolonged course of arthritis yeah. just from the vaccination itself. So how do we go about um, managing this and do, do they need further workup? Yeah, so we are starting to see cases. Um, I've already seen full-blown psoriatic arthritis developing post-vaccine 
I've actually seen patients developing a positive ANA, but we don't know whether the ANA was positive even before. Uh, we are seeing mostly musculoskeletal and cutaneous lupus post-vaccine and a few cases of uh, inflammatory erosive arthritis that has becoming described. Uh, we need more data. Uh, we definitely need more data. The numbers are still very small, but I think with the worldwide uh, adverse effects of vaccination data being collected, um, this while, while there's a lot of concern, but I think, unfortunately, this is the only way we are going to learn details of our immune system and how the immunology responds to various antigens work. So uh, we need to watch this space and you know, we are happy to have another session to talk about therapeutics and post-vaccination rheumatological disorder at a future time. That's probably a 30 minutes to one hour lecture in itself. And um, there'll be definitely a lot of feedback and I expected a very animated response from uh, the audience. Thank you, Prof. There is one question in the Q&A box from Prof. Christopher Boy. Thank you very much, Prof. Regarding the association between autoimmune disease with COVID-19, have we got evidence that COVID-19 is actually causative? Causative of? Oh, that causes the autoimmune disorder. Right. Um, so far, no. The, the fact that uh, the, the, the virus has to link up with the human body through the ACE2 protein and the transmembrane uh, serine protease 2 indicates the virus without entry into the cells is virtually useless. It needs those components. So I believe there are antibodies being developed in, uh, against ACE2. I believe there's uh, antibodies being developed. There was some worry about patients on anti, uh, ARBs and ACE inhibitors, whether by inhibiting these enzymes or by inhibiting them, whether you're going to increase the expression and therefore put these patients, hypertension patients at risk. We have data to show that that is not the case. In fact, we have to continue treatment with ACE inhibitors and ARB because these are anti-inflammatory of the vessels. That means they are anti-endothelial inflammatory drugs and they work wonderfully well. So we do know that mediators are extremely important and the virus in itself causing the disease, well, we haven't seen that perhaps yet. Maybe a future variance, but as of now, no. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, Prof. Uh, there's one question, one more question in the Q&A box. Can COVID trigger individuals at risk with an autoimmune disease? Okay, uh, the million dollar question, we have very good news. If a person already has an autoimmune disease, they are not at high risk of developing severe COVID. So we have enough data now to show that a person on immune suppression a person on immune modifying drugs or a person with existing immune, autoimmune disease is not at that much higher than the general population. So that's something that we have uh, enough data. We were always worried about people who were uh, severely immunosuppressed at higher risk. Now, in severe immunosuppression carries a different risk profile. They may be at some point um, uh, more prone to severe forms of COVID, but we have to remember they have an immune system that is attenuated. So perhaps the cytokine storm may not occur as badly as in someone who's immunocompetent. So we're not sure about that. But what we do know is we have been reassuring our patients. You can, if you, if you please get vaccinated, of course, but if you do got COVID, do not worry. Most likely it's going to be a mild uh, or two moderate forms of infection. You probably category one or two, uh, just take some days off and yeah. So it, it should be okay, yeah. Uh, and one last question, if we have a few more minutes. Prof, how about a person who has a prolonged symptom but a negative PCR test? Right. So, well, it depends. If, if um, This is um, the way we're looking at this. Perhaps we are talking about long COVID, that if these symptoms such as myalgia, uh, brain fog, uh, lethargy, perhaps a lymphopenia, uh, persistently raised creatinine kinase, a non-remitting form of arthralgia, then you probably need to think about a large vessel vasculitis. And I think we're talking about long COVID. Um, uh, really, for someone to test negative when they have COVID-19 is quite a rarity. 
Um, so we do believe that at some point they must have been positive, but because of the, the, the macrophage uh, activity, which is at a more, rather than acute, more than a sustained, but somewhat reduced, uh, that creates a poor quality of life. Another thing you have to understand that one of the ways to look for is to look for the interferon signature. Now, why do we feel sick in any viral illnesses? Why do we feel so sick that you can't get out of bed? It's because you have a high interferon gamma signature because of dendritic cell activity. So perhaps this is how we can look at uh, the, the, the patients who have this problem uh, in, in our future studies. If you can look at their, 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 their dendritic cell uh, component, whether they have higher levels, then we can predict that this is probably uh, long COVID as an inflammation and large vessel vasculitis. That's great. Thank you, Prof. I think that would be the end of our Q&A session. Thank you for your attention and we hope you've enjoyed the first session this morning. I will now pass the time over to Professor Dr. Victor Ho to moderate the next session. Good day, everyone, and stay safe. All right, thank you very much, Lydia, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dr. Ho, for a very interesting talk. Now we like, need to proceed. All right, we proceed to the next talk. And looking at the time, you only have around uh, 22 minutes. All right, so the title of the talk today will be Hearing Conservative Program for Vector Control Worker, Short-Term Outcome and from a Cluster Randomized Control Trial. So uh, our speaker today will be Dr. Rama Krishnan, who is a public health medicine specialist and occupational health physician with more than seven years experience in the field of occupational health and occupational medicine, provided essential occupational health services to various job sectors and while serving under the Department of Occupational Safety and Health before pursuing postgraduate studies in the Master of Public Health and Doctor of Public Health from the University of Malaya. He completed his training under the faculty of Occupational Medicine, Royal College of Physicians, and obtained licensee of the Faculty of Occupational Medicine. His research interest is in the field of occupational health, occupational medicine, mainly hearing conservative and noise induced hearing loss prevention. Without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Ramakrishnan to continue the talk today. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Victor, for the kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. So allow me to share my screen first. Okay, is my uh is my are my slides on slideshow view? Yes. Okay, thank you, Ralph. Okay, so good morning, everyone. So today I'll be sharing my findings from the study titled Hearing Conservation Program for Better Control Workers, uh, short-term outcomes from a cluster randomized control trial. So before I go further, I would like to acknowledge the following people, uh, Associate Prof. Dr. Mazuki and Professor Dr. Noran from the Department of Social and Preventive Medicine, as well as Dr. Priya from the Occupation and Environmental Health Sector from the Ministry of Health Malaysia, as well as the Perak State Health Department for allowing us to actually conduct the study in the state of Perak and they have been very supportive throughout this whole process. So this will be the outline of my um, talk today. We we'll start off with some background, some research objectives, followed by findings, key findings from this study itself, and finally followed by a conclusion. So, firstly, before we move further, let me just give you a brief uh, background about the issue that we're going to be uh, sharing with you today. So, firstly, occupational noise induced hearing loss is basically noise-induced hearing loss that is considered a sensory neural type of hearing loss, which is actually permanent results in permanent hearing impairment as a result of prolonged exposure to excessive noise. So the main problem with occupational noise-induced hearing loss is basically due to exposure to excessive noise at their workplace. So certain work or job categories are actually in, involves them being exposed to excessive noise at the workplace. And the problem with occupational noise induced hearing loss is basically there's a we have to understand the physiology of hearing first. So if we understand and we remember previously, the physiology of hearing shows that when the sound wave enters our external auditory canal, it actually causes our tympani membrane to vibrate. And this vibration is actually further strengthened by the occipital bones, which are then attached to the cochlea. And the important key future of occupational noise induced hearing loss is because of the impairment that occurs within the cochlea itself, which is known as the organ of cotai. 
So in this organ of Kotai is where we have our stereocilia cells. So these stereocilia cells are basically hair cells that actually convert the physical force of the vibration into an electrical activity, which is later on transmitted to our auditory nerve. So excessive noise well above 85 decibels have been actually shown to actually cause fatigue of these hair cells or the stereocilia cells, and sometimes they are transient or sometimes they can result in permanent impairment itself. So besides that, uh, occupational noise induced hearing loss also has a large magnitude in terms of uh, disability. So for example, it actually, studies have actually proven that it causes 4 million disability adjusted life years on their list. And it is also accountable for 16% of global deafness. And it also has an economic impact in which it is associated with about 0.2% to 2% of GDP in developed nations. Now, with issues pertaining or regarding this topic today. So firstly, when we look into the context of Malaysia itself, we have seen a rising trend of noise induced hearing loss in Malaysia. So there are a few factors which actually we can relate to this rising trend. Firstly is noise induced hearing loss is well regulated in Malaysia itself in terms of legislation. The second thing is because noise induced hearing loss is a progressive disease, it takes a very long period of time to actually see the impairment or assess the impairment. It can generally take around five to 10 years to actually develop. And the only early indicator for us to actually catch or capture noise induced hearing loss in the future is early audiometric threshold changes. And this early audiometric threshold changes can be in the form of temporary threshold shifts, which is transient, or they can result in permanent threshold shifts that are irreversible itself. So just to share a little, there were previous studies that were conducted in Malaysia. There was a study that was conducted in Negris Milan as well, looking into vector control workers. And what they found was that vector control workers who are foggers, which are actually involved in dengue prevention and control activities, so they conduct fogging activities, they are actually exposed to noise levels well above 90 decibels at a distance of 0.5 meters from the thermal fogging machine, which is the handheld fogging machine. And the prevalence of NIHL was found to be around 26.5% among that population. And there were also studies showing that there was a lack of knowledge, attitude, and practice towards prevention of noise-induced hearing loss among this particular population. And we have legislations that exist to actually manage and control uh, noise-related hearing disorders in Malaysia. However, because there's a large coverage area of workplaces which actually have excessive noise, it is quite hard for the enforcing uh, body to actually carry out enforcement. And the existing gaps in particular that we identified, the main thing is that there is no existing hearing conservation program specifically targeting vector control workers. So this hearing conservation program has to be job specific, meaning every job, there has to be a risk assessment done, and based on that, a specific hearing conservation program has to be developed for it. The second thing is, the second gap is that lacks evidence on evaluation of hearing conservation program effectiveness in Malaysia itself. So just to share with you what are the uh, relevant legislations when we talk about excessive noise at workplace. So firstly, there is a noise regulation 2019. So these legislations are actually enforced by the Department of Occupational Safety and Health. And it is under this regulation that is actually uh, prescribed what is the noise exposure limit or the ceiling limit, which is actually 85 decibels, meaning no worker should be exposed above 85 decibels of noise. If they are exposed to any noise levels well above 85 decibels, there is a need for the employer to actually implement a hearing conservation program at the workplace in order to reduce the exposure level itself. And in addition to the noise regulation 2019, there are other few uh, guidelines or code of practices, as you can see here. For example, there's an industry code of practice for management of occupational noise exposure and hearing conservation 2019. And under this industry code of practice, they have actually detailed out what are the components of the hearing conservation program in general? So you have to tailor it to the specific occupation and how to actually implement this hearing conservation program. 
And also in addition to that, there's another uh, guideline that complements uh, management of not excessive noise at workplace, which is management of occupational noise related hearing disorders 2021. So moving on to our study itself. So this study is generally divided into two phases. The first phase involves development of the hearing conservation program itself. And the second phase of this study includes implementation and evaluation of the program itself, in which the objective in the second phase is to determine the noise exposure level of vector control workers. And the second is to determine the effectiveness of the hearing conservation program that we have developed in preventing or reducing audiometric threshold changes among the vector control workers. So in the first phase of the study, we basically, during the development of the hearing conservation program itself, we basically used three main methods to develop this hearing conservation program. Firstly, we conducted a systematic literature review. Secondly, we actually had to engage with key stakeholders. So the first main key stakeholder was actually the vector control workers themselves, who are actually directly involved in fogging activities. And the second uh, stakeholder that we engage with is actually the Ministry of Health and the Department of Occupational Safety and Health itself. In addition to that, we also reviewed existing local guidelines and legislations, as well as some international guidelines, specifically looking into hearing conservation program. So these are the three methods that we used to actually develop the hearing conservation program itself, which, consisted, which consists of the eight components as stated in this slide. So I will look, I will explain further into the components of the hearing conservation program in, in the slides in the future. So for the systematic review that was conducted, basically what we looked into was uh, evidence for effective workplace interventions to prevent noise induced hearing loss. And we looked into three databases, mainly PubMed, Sinal, and Scopus. So out of which we identified 203 articles but upon screening and uh, fitting into our eligibility, uh, our screening criteria, we actually narrowed it down to nine key articles, which we went through in detail. And the key findings from these nine articles was that there were three effective strategies that were identified in prevention of NIHR. And the key one was multifactorial approach, meaning uh, not a single intervention is actually uh, successful in prevention of NIHR, whereas an intervention that combines multiple strategies actually found to be more effective. Secondly, championed by leaders, meaning there is a need for a very good support system by the employer itself to ensure the success of this hearing conservation program or prevention strategies towards NIHR to ensure its objective is actually achieved. And the third thing is, of course, another key strategy was training itself. But one-off training was found to have only a modest immediate effect, but a better approach would be to have continuous training because a one-off training just only gives you uh, an effective, uh, we only see the effectiveness for a short period of time, but it actually wins off eventually, all right? So what we found out is we wanted to create a comprehensive multifactorial intervention that combines multiple strategies in our hearing conservation program itself. So moving on next, I'm going to actually explain to you and share what the intervention actually consists of, which is our hearing conservation program. So in a nutshell, the intervention of the hearing conservation program has eight components. The first component is a safety and health policy. And this was actually an existing written policy that is uh, available by the Ministry of Health for their workers. What we did was we just actually made it more visible and we explained the safety and health policy to the vector control workers in the intervention group during the training and education program. And secondly, we also conducted noise monitoring as well, uh, which is part of our high rec process, which is hazard identification, risk assessment, and risk control. So as part of this noise monitoring process, we actually did an area monitoring and we created a noise mapping, which I'll share the findings with you later, as well as personal noise monitoring levels of the workers. And based on those risk assessment, we actually recommended and made some uh, noise control recommendations to help reduce the excessive noise levels. 
So this came in terms of administrative control, where we had actually advised them on periodic preventive maintenance of the fogging machines itself. And in addition to that, we made them ensure that there's proper signage to wear hearing protectors that were made visible on the fogging machine itself. Fourthly, we also looked into their current hearing protection devices if they have, and we ensured that they were all provided with hearing protection devices, a year mark. So what we did was we looked into the single number rating and we found that we checked if the attenuation level was adequate or inadequate in providing hearing protection to the workers itself. The fifth component of the hearing conservation program was a training and education program. So this training and education program consists of a two hour presentation. There was a hands-on workshop on how to actually use and care for your hearing protection devices. And an interesting, during, an interesting thing during this training education program, we also communicated findings from our noise exposure monitoring to the workers themselves. So this was very helpful because they actually got some sort of objective findings uh, from our study. And it was, the idea behind it was it is actually to trigger behavior change as well. And the sixth component was actually audiometric testing in which we gave them an appointment card to serve as a reminder. And they had a baseline uh, audiometric testing and three months post-intervention audiometric testing. And the seventh component, we actually created a systematic record keeping for them to keep relevant documents as stated here. And the eighth component, we also gave them a flowchart to be displayed at uh, their district health offices to show, to remind everyone on the implementation of the hearing conservation program itself. And they also provided which are, with an evaluation form to actually review the program to ensure that it's being implemented in the way it was supposed to be and the objectives were actually achieved. So this was just um, the module. We, the module basically consists of a 40 page uh, book in which we actually gave it to selected hearing conservation program coordinators. So this hearing conservation program coordinators were basically selected from the each intervention group and they were responsible in actually implementing this program. So this served as a guide for them as well. So moving on to the second phase, which is actually the implementation of this hearing conservation program and evaluation of the effectiveness of this program itself. So the method that we actually use for this study, the study design is a cluster randomized control trial in which the unit of randomization for this study was actually a district health office itself, which is the cluster. So we randomized uh, nine out of the 11 district health offices in the state of Perak into either the intervention arm or the control arm itself. And our population of interest, our study population was actually vector control workers who were directly involved in fogging activities. And the sample size was, was for this study was 183 participants uh, with 60 in the intervention group and 123 participants in the control group itself. The sampling method was a cluster random sampling. So for this uh, cluster RCT, we actually uh, implemented a single blinding method because we could not go with double blinding because uh, the intervention itself, especially the training education program was provided by the researcher. However, the outcome assessors where audiometric testing was actually being conducted. So the outcomes was actually assessed by people who were, they did not know what uh, group the participants actually belonged to. All right, so they were blinded. And the instruments used for this study, mainly we use uh, two instruments. The first was a calibrated sound level meter for the area monitoring. And the second for the personal noise monitoring, we actually used a noise dosimeter. And for the audiometric testing, we actually used a calibrated, calibrated audiometry boot. So this audiometry boot was made available at certain health clinics within the state of Pera itself. They had about four boots. So we actually got our vector control workers or participants in our study to go to this particular health clinics to get them tested. So the outcomes that were assessed uh, in this study was basically changes in audiometric hearing threshold levels, which was actually measured using the calibrated audiometry boot. And these outcomes were actually measured prior to intervention at baseline, as well as three months post-intervention itself meaning three months after implementation of the 
hearing conservation program itself. So this is just to share the study flow chart. So um, we had our uh, outcomes measured at baseline and at three months. So we started off with 183 participants. And at the final count, we actually had a loss to full up of around 16.6%, which was actually well below 25%. Uh, so it was fairly good as well. So moving on to the results and key findings that we found from this study, um, what we can see is from the results, basically we're going to report on mainly the key findings are on noise exposure level and secondly on the audiometric threshold changes seen at baseline and then what are the changes that we see after three months of intervention itself. So if we look at the sociodemographic characteristic of participants itself, in both groups, uh, majority of the participants were males, which was expected because generally uh, the vector control workers were involved directly in fogging activities are uh, uh, males because they have to carry, it's quite heavy, the thermal fogging machine. And um, in terms of age, the mean age of the participants was around 37 years of age for both groups. And looking back and looking on into noise exposure, occupational and noise exposure characteristics, characteristics of the participants itself. So duration of employment was actually key. And we found that the intervention and control group showed an average duration of employment for the intervention group was around 7.5 years. And the control group was around 9.3 years. Mama. A majority of the participants were actually of general workers. Mama. So the gen, sorry? Sorry, you, you have two minutes more. Okay, thank you, Rob. And, um, in terms of use of fogging machine, majority of the participants actually were directly involved in handling the fogging machine itself in both groups. So just to share key findings itself for the noise exposure level. So the noise mapping done, basically we took uh, multiple measurement points from the fogging machine itself that was put out in an open field. And we found that for the level to actually drop below 85 decibels, was at a level of seven meters from the fogging machine itself. So the picture on your right is a thermal fogging machine, meaning it is handheld, huh? it's handheld. And because some of the vector control workers themselves, they are not directly handling the fogging machine, but they're actually at the area because they're supervising, they're doing some supervisory work or they're helping with actually refilling the pesticide itself within the machine, all right? So we recommended a safe distance of seven meters to those who are actually not using any hearing protection devices, all right? And the noise mapping for the ultra low volume fogging machine. So there's another type of fogging machine that was used as well, but this is mounted to the back of a truck. And for this machine, the noise mapping showed that at a distance of four meters from the machine, because this, the motor is on one side of the machine, the level actually drops to 85 decibels at four meters or above, all right? And in terms of noise exposure level, when we look at the eight hour time weighted average for their personal noise monitoring, for the intervention group, as you can see, it was 87.3 and the control group, it was 93.1 decibels. And this was well above the prescribed noise exposure limit of 85 decibels. So they are at risk of noise induced hearing loss in the long future. And for the ULB fogging machine, it was well below 85 decibels for both the intervention and control group. So this was not much of an issue. In terms of hearing protected attenuation, based on their hearing protection device that was actually used, we found that by using this, their protected eight hour time weighted average or the attenuation level attained was actually 74.8 decibels for the intervention group and 80.6 decibels for the control group, meaning that the hearing protection device that they were using with the single number rating of 32 decibels was actually adequate. And I'm towards the end of my presentation already. Um, in terms of changes in mean hearing threshold level, so this is for the left ear comparing the intervention and the control group. The blue solid lines are actually pre-intervention or baseline and the dotted lines are actually post-intervention. So what you can see in this graph is basically the mean hearing threshold level for all frequencies. And what was found is both groups 
showed a reduction or improvement, showed a reduction in hearing threshold level. But the left ear mean hearing threshold level in the intervention room showed significant improvement for all frequencies post intervention. And the largest reduction was actually seen at 6,000 kilohertz with a 5.4 decibel reduction. It was found to be significant itself. Meanwhile, for the right ear, the changes in mean hearing threshold level, it was slightly different in trend in comparison to the left ear. But at 6,000 and 8,000 hertz, you can, you, you can actually see that the control group showed worsening shift or there was a worsening shift in audiometric threshold changes in comparison to the intervention group itself. But these uh, findings were actually not significant. So in conclusion, um, this study actually showed that vector control workers or foggers are actually exposed to noise levels well above 85 decibels and are at risk of developing noise induced hearing loss in the future. And there is a need for and if uh, for there is a need for an effective hearing conservation program to be implemented to actually protect them. And um, the recommendations from this study is we needed more long term effectiveness studies because uh, we only work for three months with implementation of this program. Probably we need maybe a longer term study where it is three years and five year follow up and so on. And of course, continuous training and education programs are needed to ensure a positive OSH culture at the workplace itself. Okay, thank you. That's all from me. All right, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rama. And I think we have three questions there. One, for, the first one is from uh, Professor Sagunan. And he asked, was asking, is there a way of, to automate or detect decibel levels of workers exposed to an app that can measure since Enforcement is difficult. Okay, thank you, Ross Agunen. So actually, there is, um, I'm aware that actually we, last time when I was working in the Department of Occupation Safety and Health as well, we sometimes do use uh, an app on our phone to actually determine uh, area monitoring level. But however, it is not prescribed legislatively, it will not stand uh, the reading. So you still need to get proper area monitoring and for audiometric threshold changes, they have to go to a calibrated audiometry booth itself to determine their hearing threshold levels. Let, let us move on from the same question. So, so what are the what are the measures that basically currently that they are they are asking they are doing so to ensure that the workplace is, is noise safe? Okay, all right. So, what was actually existing practices? So, when we are talking about existing practices currently for vector control workers, so firstly, a key gap that we identified was. Firstly, the practice is not homogeneous across, across the country, meaning there are places who are providing proper hearing protection devices. Some are providing hearing protection devices, but of course the use and care, wear and tear, this is all questionable. And then the second thing is in terms of practices itself, because the model of the machine is also not homogeneous. There are various models actually used depending on the purchase itself by the district health office. So the problem that we identified was, firstly, the hearing protection devices were actually not checked. The sound attenuation level was actually not assessed before. The monitoring of the machines, including area monitoring and personal noise monitoring has never been done. Although legislatively there is a requirement to actually do it, but due to costing, it was never been actually done. And because of this, there are a lot of gaps that are changed. So they are being provided with hearing protection devices, but we don't know. We don't know the area monitoring. We don't know the personal noise monitoring levels. We don't know what is the single number rating of the uh, hearing protection device itself. So all these components don't gel together. That's why the hearing conservation program that we developed was a holistic thing, meaning it's how it should be. Okay, uh, there's two more questions from uh, Kamala. And people working in noise area, how often should we send them for audiometry? Okay, so thank you for the question. So for excessive noise currently following the noise regulation 2019, it is actually annually now. So they have to go for audiometric threshold, uh, audiometric uh, measurement or annually, meaning once a year, if they're exposed to excessive noise based on the noise risk assessment that was done. So what, what do you mean by excessive noise? So excessive noise, basically noise regulation is actually 82 decibels and above. So in this regulation, 
if you look at the noise exposure limit or the ceiling limit is 85 decibels itself, but 82 decibels and above is considered excessive noise. Okay. And uh, the last question, uh, basically people listening to music using headset device, how much decibel are, are, are they exposed to? Okay, all right. So this one is a very tricky question because it depends on how loud you actually put your hearing, your hearing device to as well. But of course, the important thing to understand is, you see, as I mentioned, even if noise induced hearing loss, it's not a single exposure. So it's sort of like there's some sort of those, those response relationship where it's accumulated exposure over a number of years. So we don't see the impairment or disability in the near future. So of course, I, I, can't, I can't answer this question because it depends on how your usage is and your practice is. Okay, uh, two more questions before we, we let you go. Firstly, uh, as, as you mentioned, you, your, your intervention only carried out for three months. So what, what do you think currently uh, is happening? And whether, whether you actually have, have planned to actually uh, 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 develop or specifically uh, promote your intervention program, your eight-step intervention program to the whole country? Okay. Okay, thank you for the question. So firstly, the intention to actually develop the sharing conservation program was to actually make it into, a, uh, to translate this research into practice itself. So hence why we actually engaged with the key stakeholders, which was the occupation and environmental health sector in Putrajaya, in the Ministry of Health. The aim was actually to develop this program and implement it across the whole country. But because of COVID and everything, everything has been on hold. But the idea is still to actually develop and implement it. The idea is to implement it to the whole country. So how, how are you going to do it? So what, what we plan to do was actually come up with a guideline. So the hearing conservation program that we have, we plan to uh, make, it in, make it available in a book. And then what we plan to do is we actually plan to share with all key stakeholders. And the important thing is we need to get this as a policy as well. So it has to come from the higher authority within the Ministry of Health itself. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rama. I think that that's all for the day. And thank you very much for being here. And thank you all those who are still with us, the three of us for staying, staying so long to with us and I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to I'd like to apologize for, for delaying, delaying for nine minutes. All right. Thank you and see you again next week. Uh, same time for breakfast at UM Health. Bye. Okay, thank you, bro. Thank you, everyone.